start that up. Okay. And so what we're going to do here is, um, first I wanted to show you where the materials are because we did change the page around a little bit. Um, so, and please mute your phones. I'm getting some feedback. I'm going to go ahead and see if I can stop that here. Okay. All right. So, um, where we have um, re posted all of our training materials is on the wiki. There is a uh, SSDT meetings and trainings page out there on the wiki. And what I've done, if I just go to that main, main SSDT meetings and training page, we have um, changed this up a little bit. And what we've done is we have a listing of the training webinars and registration information right up at the top. So you can go right to those links and look at what's scheduled. So there's not a whole lot out there right now, <laughs> so, but we will be adding more information on. Um, we do have, um, I do plan on doing one regarding financial reports, um, creating them like, your, like old, the old classic FISC web. So that's something I'm planning hopefully on doing here in the month of December and having that on a Friday like we normally do. Um, so that type of information will be out here underneath this SSDT training website. So when I click on this website here, it's going to take us to what we have, and obviously we have um, the one today, and the next one we have is the, class, or is the redesign calendar year end uh, webinar that we'll have in a couple weeks. I'm going to hit my back button here. And also any previously recorded sessions, whether they were Friday, uh, Fridays with Fiscal, or um, we just did the report one, Jody did that one at the end of October. Um, those are out there as well underneath um, this link right here. So you guys can go out there, or if you want your districts to go out there and review these webinars, they can. So they're available out there. Um, then we have a section on meeting materials. Um, so, and we've broken this down, classic versus the redesign. So these are the meeting materials, meaning the agenda, the PowerPoint, closing procedures, any supporting documentation. That information is going to be available under the meeting materials section of this wiki page. So, and then we've broken it down, um, the classic ones. So here is the agenda, uh, PowerPoints, and things like that for today's meeting. Um, and then we also have one for fiscal year end from the last fiscal year end. And then for the redesign, um, this one is a work in progress, the class, um, or I'm sorry, the calendar year end one. Um, we just have a couple things out there. I do not have anything out there for USAS yet. So if you go out there and try and look up information, you're not going to find anything right now. So we will have that available before we meet. And then obviously when we do the fiscal year end, we'll have that available too. Um, so, so another thing as well is we have training materials. Um, regarding the beginner and intermediate training. So as we have mentioned a few months ago, we are not going to be doing actual training uh, for the classic software anymore. So we have been out there trying to create uh, training web or videos, um, recorded videos that new ITC fiscal staff can review um, regarding the classic software. So that information is in here, um, the actual materials. So the PowerPoints that we go over in those recorded webinars, um, just the agenda, it's just an FYI basically. Any supporting materials are available in this section. So we have it for classic beginner and intermediate. And the actual videos, recorded videos, are underneath this recorded classic training videos page. So we've got the beginner ones for payroll and USAS and the intermediate. And so we're, we're still working on these. They are not by no means all complete. So um, when we have time, we're trying to record these videos as well. Um, but there are um, uh, quite a few of them out there already. So you guys can look those up. I'm also putting them out there on the SSDT's YouTube channel. 
So if you go out to our YouTube channel, um, there are what we call classic playlists for both USAS and payroll, and they will be alphabetized out there, and uh, you can go out there and look at them as well in there. So that's what we're planning on shifting a lot of this stuff and making it available on our SSDT channel on YouTube. Okay, so um, our meeting today, then you're basically going to be going into this meeting materials for the 2018 ITC Classic year end. So when I click on that, it brings up our agenda for today, as well as um, the USAS calendar year end presentation, which is what I'm gonna be doing here in a couple minutes, and our closing checklist, which is a generic checklist that we've used um, for quite a few years. Really nothing has changed on that checklist so um, from last year. Um, and then we also have the payroll ones. So Lori's got the presentation out here as well as all the supporting documentation um, and the actual closing procedures checklist down here. So, um, so everything that you need for today's meeting is right in this location. Okay, well, I'm gonna go ahead and get started with the USAS portion and then Lori is going to cover the payroll. Any questions before we get started? You can enter them in chat or you can unmute your phone and, and ask um, any questions that you have. Okay, well we'll go ahead and get started here. So for the USAS calendar and closing, uh, what we're going to do is we're gonna talk about um, the submission information to the IRS. So it's gonna be the same as last year, January 31st. So they didn't cut us a break yet. So all the 1099s will have to be posted and submitted to the IRS by the January 31st deadline. We will also talk about the TR 1099 program. So for those of you that are on uh, the phone that have not been through a calendar year end uh, at your ITC, uh, we will go through um, the TR 1099, I'll take you through a sample run so you can see what it looks like. Um, this is the step that we as ITC fiscal staff do. So um, the districts are not running the TR 1099, we are. So after all of our districts complete their 1099s using the F 1099 program, we append all of those tape files that are generated with the 1099 and we submit them or we create a single file with all of those 1099 tape files using this TR 1099 program. And then that information can then be submitted through the IRS's fire system. Um, so it can be submitted to the IRS before the January 31st deadline. Okay, so one thing to keep in mind, and this is just a reminder, is that vendors TIN, so the TIN type is located in Vend Screen. You are not going to find it in USAS Web's vendors program. They never put it out there. So if a district created a new vendor and um, they um, added an ID number, whether it was just a social security number or a tax ID number, um, they need to define, is it an SSN or an EIN. So in Venn screen is where they're gonna go ahead and label that. So that's one thing that they need to look at ahead of time. And what I usually, the quickest way to find them is to run an F-1099 report. So if they're not sure, they can go out there and quick run an F-1099 report and they'll get errors on those vendors that do not have the SSN or EIN type um, identified. So um, it'll show exactly who those vendors are, then they can go into Venn screen, um, put in an S or an E, and then rerun F1099 again, and that error should go away. So right here is where it's labeled, it's right next to the ID number here, SSN or EIN. So obviously if you've got you know, vendors that you've used in prior years that you've issued 1099s for, they're good. They already have that SSN or EIN in them, so you don't have to worry about it, putting it in there again. Once you set it once, you're good. So the uh, next thing that we have them do is go in and check the data for their 1099 vendors. So 
they can run the VEN SSN option, or the, I'm sorry, the VEN SSN report, and in there, there are a few different options that they can select. So option four is going to give them all 1099 miscellaneous vendors uh, with a year-to-date activity meeting the IRS requirement, which is $600 or more. So it's going to go out there on the vendor file and look for those vendors that have a 1099 type, um, whether it's other income, you know, attorney's gross proceeds, whatever it is, um, and it's going to pull all those up on a report um, as long as their year-to-date amount is $600 or more. And then they can look at that information and it's going to provide their address and their ID number. It doesn't provide the SSN or EIN type, so unfortunately that report you really can't tell if they have it set or not. Um, so that's why I recommend running an F-1099 to find out that information. Um, but it's got the address information and their year-to-date amounts. Um, if those year-to-date amounts are incorrect, and let's say they really only want to post a certain amount to be submitted to the IRS, they can modify the year-to-date amounts. Um, they can go into either USAS Web into the vendors program and modify the year, calendar year-to-date amount there, or they can do an event screen. Um, another option they can run with the event SSN is 1099 mis miscellaneous vendors regardless of the year-to-date activity. So if they run option six, it's going to go out there and generate a report of all their 1099 vendors. Um, whether it's $5 that um, uh, is tracked on the year-to-date amount or, you know, $5,000, um, it's going to pull all of them on the report. So sometimes we get the question, well, I need to look at a report um, of vendors that I've spent $600 or more and I'm not quite sure if I marked them as 1099 vendors. There is an option five in, in Venn screen that they can run and it's going to generate a list of all vendors um, that have a year-to-date amount of $600 or more. So they could review that list. That's probably going to be a pretty good size list, but they could review that list and look to see, oh, this vendor should have been marked as a 1099 vendor and then they can go into the vendor program and set up the um, 1099 type for that vendor. So we have three different ways to kind of check and see to make sure that all of your 1099 vendors are ready to go for you to then run the F1090 or for the district to then run the F1099 program for the calendar year. So this is an example of the VEN SSN report. So as you can see, it shows, like I said, the SSN, and it does show the year-to-date amount, um, but what you don't see is like the SSN or EIN type. So that type of stuff's not on here, but they get a pretty good in, uh, generalized information of you know, what vendors are going to get a 1099 for the year. So if the vendor uses a different name for 1099 reporting, um, the district may enter that 1099 reportable name on the second name field on the vendor record. So one thing that they have to do, though, is they have to put in 1099 colon before. It has to precede that uh, name. So it's 1099 colon Sue Jones. And then when the 1099 is created, the name's going to be Sue Jones. It will not be the business that she is um, conducting. Um, <clears throat> so that kind of explains that there. So here's an example. So I have ABC Consulting, and I have um, on the second name field, 1099 colon Fran Smith. So when this gets pulled on a purchase order, um, we have a little screenshot here showing of what it's going to look like. So it's going to say ABC Consulting 1099 Fran Smith and the address information. If the district doesn't want that to show all year on the purchase orders, then they can just put in the second name field right before they run their 1099. That way it just appears. Then, um, you know, there probably won't be many POs generated with that. Um, so they probably would just want to put that right before they run the F-1099 program 
And what it's going to do then is it will exclude the actual 1099 um, word, and it's going to put the first name there. So it's going to put Fran Smith on the actual 1099, um, and then the rest of the address information. So if they want to leave it up all year, and they really you know, don't mind it showing on um, the purchase orders, they can. They can enter this in, and it can stay in all year. But if they'd rather just do it right before they run 1099s, they can go into the vendor, put in 1099 colon, the actual name that should be submitted to the IRS, and then they can take it back out when they're done running. <clears throat> so what the 1099, the F1099 program is looking at it's looking at, obviously, the name and the second name field and the address information, um, as well as the 1099 type and the ID and the SSN or EIN. I don't have a screenshot of that, but it looks at that as well. And the calendar year to date amount. Those are the fields that it's looking at. Okay, so that's kind of just uh, <clears throat> pre-steps um, to, to do before they actually start um, closing out for the month of December. So these are things they could be doing now in order to get ready. And I know we've had a couple districts ask already, people running the event SSN report and things like that, um, just to make sure that everything's accounted for and that all of their 1099 vendors are in order for the calendar year. So I'm going to go through the month end closing now and just go through that. It's the same as it's always been, nothing different, but for those of you that may be new, I just want to go through month and closing in detail. And so this is the generic closing. So this might be different than from what you're doing at your ITC. So you guys might have certain procedures that you run or automated procedures you run um, that are different than what we have here, but these are the recommended steps. Like I said, you can have additional ones, and that's fine. It's you know up to your ITC, but um, here's what things that we would like you to do. Um, so you're going to proceed with closing out for the month of December. So you're basically entering all your transactions for the current month, making sure everything gets posted for the end of December. Um, there is a bank reconciliation procedure out there in the USAS user guide underneath the USAS useful procedures chapter and districts can use that. Some districts have their own bank reconciliation procedure, but just want to make sure that they reconcile for the month. Um, and then um, the reports that they're going to run, um, recommended reports, USA EMS EDT, there is a cash reconciliation option, and they can run that for the month of December and make sure that what they enter in their reconciliation um, is matching with what is currently on the system. So there are two totals at the end of the report, and those totals um, should match. So they want to make sure that that's all good to go. Um, the next thing they're going to do is run a PO detail of outstanding purchase orders. And they kind of set that aside, and then they go out and run a bell check. <clears throat> and the bell check is showing you by timeline here, um, what the month fiscal and year-to-date expended amounts are for the month of uh, December, as well as year-to-date and fiscal year-to-date amounts. There's also a section for outstanding conferences. So for that particular row on the bell check, um, it shows the outstanding encumbered amount, and that outstanding encumbered amount on the bell check should match the PO detail. Those two figures should match. If for some reason they don't, then there, we do have a program called Fixed Encumbrance, F-I-X-E-N-C, that districts can run and that may bring those, or recalculate the encumbrances and may bring that information back in order. If it doesn't, then they'll be calling you guys to see if you can help them as to why their outstanding encumbrances do not uh, match. Next step is to run the FinSum. Um, so when you run the FinSum in Classic, you can set yes to generate the Fin detail at the same time. And it's going to, going to run both reports, and you're going to get a summary output at the end on the screen showing the balance for the FinSum and the balance for the Fin debt. Those should match to the penny. These are your cash balances. 
So what um, these two reports are doing, the thin sum is looking at all the balances on the account file, and the thin detail is looking at all of the um, amounts from all the transactions that were posted against those accounts, and those should be in agreement. So if they aren't, then they should be calling you guys again to see why the thin sum and the thin detail are out of balance. Um, another thing that they can run, um, it's not required, um, but they can run the SM2 calc, and what that's going to do, this is for their SM2 figures, and it's going to calculate the SM2 figures for the month of December. If they don't run the SM2 calc, when a just is run at the end of the month, it will run SM2 calc automatically. So, but if they want to see those figures before they close out, they can by all means go in and run the SM2 calc um, before they proceed with the next step. The next one is going to be monthly CD. So they're going to run monthly CD for the month of December, and that should generate a December link out there on the monthly CD website. Um, and they should be going out there and checking that to make sure that it ran okay. Um, and we hate to see a missed month um, for some reason. Um, sometimes it's difficult to get those files again um, if you don't do some type of backup of them. So we always make sure that they go out there and look to see that those reports are generated. So, and then we do have a listing there of minimum <clears throat> recommended reports that they run for the month. And all of these reports listed here are on monthly CD. Um, and then obviously the district can run whatever else they want for the month of December. So then the next thing is to create a copy of the calendar year-end files. So it's going to be a backup of their calendar year-end data. So whatever procedure your ITC performs to create a copy of the calendar year-end files, you'll go ahead and do that. I know every ITC has a different one. After that, we do have a VH reset option that districts can run at the end of the calendar year. Um, this is part of the Then Hire um, program. So Then Hire has two options. It's got a report option and it has a VH reset. So districts will be running or they should be running the Then Hire report probably every month, might make it part of their month end closing to go out there to see if there are any basically independent contractors, which are mainly your 1099 vendors, and making sure if they have they met the $2,500 threshold um, in order for their data to be submitted to the new hire reporting center. Um, so they can run then hire every month. And what happens is for those 1099 vendors, so when you look at uh, independent contractor vendor on the vendor program, there is a section for the then hire information. And one of them is the status and it's going to say um, reportable. And so when that's checkmarked, when that's selected, what happens then is then hire looks to see, oh, so this is a reportable vendor. And so once I meet the year-to-date amount of $2,500, it's going to put that vendor on the then hire report. And then what's going to happen then is that it's sets that status from reportable to reported. So that vendor has been reported then to the new hire reporting center for the year. Now, it does create a text file um, when you run the vent hire report and the, and the district can either fax that information to the new hire reporting center or they can take that information and log in to the new hire reporting center and enter that. So they somehow need to get the information down to the new hire reporting center, but this program, the Venn Hire program, will do that for them throughout the year. So at the end of the calendar year then, um, what the VH reset does is it goes out there and looks for all of those vendors that have a status of reported and sets them back to a reportable status for the new year. That way then, once they meet that $2,500 threshold again, They'll change, it'll change the status to reported and the vendor will get reported again to the new hire reporting center for calendar year 19. So that's all this VH reset is doing. So what it's going to do is it's going to create a text file and it's just going to show those vendors where their status was changed back to reportable. 
So the next step is to run Adjust, and um, they need to run it first for the month of December, and obviously they should not be running any other programs while Adjust is being run. So that'll go out there and clear out the month to date figures for December. And at this point, what they're going to do is run the F1099 program. And so this is going to create their 1099s for calendar year 18. And so this is just a screenshot of um, what all is basically the summary option in the F1099 program. Um, I'll go ahead and run that quick here in my sample file. I'll bring that over here to the screen. For those of you that have not seen the F1099 program before, so it's going to basically ask you, is this the correct program? So this is one of our, our oldie but goodie um, prompting programs here in Classic. And it's going to ask for the federal EIN number, and I'm just going to make one up here, and the district. Um, so it pulls that in from the configuration screen. Phone number, there's an extension. And what is the minimum amount for reporting? And usually people will let this default um, just to the $600, which is the IRS required minimum. And there's also a minimum amount for royalty payments. And do you want to report vendors with no ID number? So that's a prompt here, and it's going to default to no. Um, so it will not pull in those vendors that do not have an ID number. Do you want to utilize the check name and address information, yes or no? Do you want to create a tape submission file? So this is where it creates the .tap file. So if I say yes to this, it's going to prompt me for the year. And if I have a payer uh, name control, number um, that can be put in here as well. I, we, our districts, we don't have anything like that with like our Nowaka districts. We don't, uh, they don't put anything in there. <clears throat> and then here's the screenshot basically of what you're seeing on the PowerPoint slides. Just a recap of what all you entered in. And if everything looks good, um, then you just go ahead and hit enter. If you want to change something, you can go to that particular line number and make a change. Do you want to print a dummy 1099 form for form alignment? Oh, I hope not. I hope everyone's on <laughs> not using a, a line printer anymore to print the 1099s. So I think all of us are using Edge or some other third party to print the 1099 forms. So you can just say no to this, which is the default. And then, sorry, I'm in some test data, so nothing's out there. But what it's going to do, it's going to create some output files, and we're going to talk about those here in a little bit. It's going to create a text file, which is the report, the tape file. Um, it's going to create the DAP file and a form file. So we'll get into those here in a little bit. But those are the uh, four output files that will get generated. So here they are. So the uh, text file is the report. So that's going to re show up all the 1099 vendors. And, and it's going to be sorted by their miscellaneous income type. <clears throat> the DAP file is the file that's going to be used with your laser-generated forms. So that's the .dat file. So that's what we're going to be using to print off their 1099s through. I think most of you use Edge's um, accountability program, and so we're going to be using that same DAP file to print off from there. The .frm is a file containing the 1099 information for blank PIN-FED forms. So I, I don't believe anyone's still using the PIN-FED forms, but if they are, they're using the .form file instead of the .dat file. And then the tape file is the tape containing, uh, containing the vendor's 1099 information, and that's the file then that's going to get appended with all your other schools, um, school districts tape file and then that one file then will get submitted to the IRS using that TR-1099 program. So you should probably have some type of form of communication with your districts uh, when they have completed the F-1099 program so that 
Um, you're able to go in and do what you need to do. If you guys are responsible for printing them, then you would need to go in and print those for them. So once your 1099s are done, then the last thing they need to do to close out for the year is to run adjust. And they're going to mark calendar. And um, so they're going to select year end and then calendar. And they should not be in anything when they're running this. And that's going to go out there. And it already cleared out all their month to date. Now it's going to go out there and clear out all the calendar to date amounts. So if you go and look at a particular budget account and you see fiscal to date, month to date, calendar to date, it's going to wipe out all of those calendar to date figures on the account file and on the vendor. So your vendor's calendar to date amounts are going to be cleared out as well. Um, 1099 submissions to the IRS. This is, again, just a reminder of the early reporting deadline, January 31st, for um, your 1099 miscellaneous forms. And if you electronically submit your 1099 data on behalf of your districts, you're going to, again, use the IRS FIRE system. So we do recommend that you set your own deadline with your districts in regards to when they need to complete the F-1099 program. So you want to give yourself enough time in order to get everybody's files and append it and submit it to the IRS before the 31st. So, you know, a few days before, you know, the 31st, they should have um, their 1099 finished um, and ready for you to um, print and append the file. So one thing I wanted to make note of, back on October 30th, an oops patch was sent out uh, fixing an issue with the numerics on the vendor name. So both the F-1099 and the TINMATCH programs, if the vendor name one or vendor name two had a numeric other than 1099 colon, um, it wasn't printing that numeric um, on the uh, tape file um, and on the TINMATCH.txt file. So we fixed that so that those should be on there now for both of those formats. So the files involved with the OOPS patch um, should still be available in OECN OOPS, and they're the F1099.exe and the bat underscore tinmatch.exe files. So this is just an example of what we do here at NOWACA. Um, just to kind of give you a heads up of, you know, this is how we process the 1099s for our districts. So after we receive an email from the district saying that they completed the 1099, we go out there and look to see if all four uh, output files have been created. You know, we're really looking at the DAT file and that tape file, um, make sure that they generated the tape file. Obviously, we're going to use the DAT file right away to print off the 1099. But eventually, we're going to need that tape file so we can append all of our district's tape files together so that we can submit it to the IRS. We do rename those files to a different extension in order to save them uh, for later use. So we have just a little um, .com procedure we use that basically sets the text file or in all the different output files to like the f1099.txt underscore 18 or something like that um, to show that, you know, we have them and they won't get automatically deleted off the system. And then we save those um, 1099 files and burn it to a DVD. So the DAP file then is what we use, um, and we uh, use that with the EDGE software to generate the 1099 forms to print on self-sealing uh, 1099 miscellaneous laser forms. And so after those 1099s are printed and the district copy of the 1099 is made, and we just put that on regular 8.5 by 11, we just print it out on that, we run the 1099 then through an envelope sealer to seal them. So you guys probably do the same thing. You probably use some self-sealing um, 1099 form as well. So what happens then is we take that and send out to each of our districts a copy of um, each 1099, so the self-sealed one and the district copy, the 1099 report, and instructions on how to distribute the 1099s to their vendors. So, so that's just a little you know, FYI of how we do it here at NOWACA. Every 
ITC does it, you know, differently, but that's just how we proceed with getting the 1099s out to our um, districts. So the next thing I want to talk about is the TR-1099 program. And so this is creating and transmitting the 1099 data to the IRS. So if there are 250 or more 1099 miscellaneous forms that um, must be reported on magnetic media or electronically, um, it has to be done um, and submitted to the IRS by January 31st. They have an IRS FIRE website um, that you're going to go in there to submit that. So first time transmitters must send a 4419 form before submitting their 1099s electronically. I believe all the ITCs have already done, you know, have been doing this for, you know, quite a few years. So I doubt that there's anybody that it's going to be a first timer here, but if so, that's what they need to fill out. And a transmitter control code will be assigned by the IRS then when that gets filled out. So if you've never submitted before, um, a test file is required before you do the actual submission. Um, but we also recommend that those of you that have submitted before to still do a test submission every year, just to make sure that things are okay. We still do that at NAWACA, and I believe that's open now um, on the IRS's. They have a separate test website that you can go in and run a test submission. Um, so we, we still do that every year as well, just to make sure that everything's okay. Um, the IRS 1096 transmittal form is not required for um, electronic reporting, so you do not need to have that um, with your um, electronic reporting. So this is a slide talking about creating that test file. So um, if you've never submitted for, you must create a test file and also in order to get approval for combined federal state filing. So um, this goes in and shows you the steps on how to do that. So it just, you know, their requirements are, it may include one or more districts 1099 files. Um, it must be at least 11 vendors, and those are called B records per district. Um, in the TR 1099 program, which we'll go into here in a little bit, um, there is a test option. So you're going to be selecting that test option when you do a test submission. And then, like I said, there's a separate website for fire tests. So you're going to go to that website and submit a test 1099 run. So there will be um, an approval letter or email from the IRS. Um, uh, so, so all that information needs to be taken care of, you know, probably around this time of year. So you can do this now starting in November. So if test sub submission all goes well, then you can go in and actually do your real submission when you're ready at the end of January. So when you're ready to do the actual submission, or what they call original submission, you are going to go to the IRS's FIRE website. So separate from the test one, and that's the link for it. So again, we're just noting two different submissions, original and test, two different websites. So when you're ready to run the TR-1099 program, the first thing you need to do before that is you need to append all of your district's .tap files into one. So this is an append procedure we use in BMS, um, and so it just shows an example, so we're basically finding those F-1099 files, and I would strongly recommend that you look over your districts to make sure that you have the correct 1099.tap file, so you don't have one from last year. So any from, you know, 2017 or before that, those should not be included in. So make sure that you're just pulling the calendar year 18 uh, 1099.tap file. So you're running this append procedure, and saying that you want it to go all appended into one file, and this is the name of the file, so f 1099 whatever, um, in order to create a file then that needs to be used in the TR-1099 program. So this is where you're going to go in and run then TR-1099 when you're ready to create that file to submit to the IRS. 
So you're going to need that appended file that you just created. Um, it is going to create an output file and something like irstax.dat, I believe, is the default that gets created. Um, it's going to prompt for the transmitter's taxpayer ID number and the transmitter's name, the company name and address. So that's us, that's the ITC. Um, the contact person at the ITC, in case there are questions, it's going to ask for their phone number, um, their name, obviously, email address, in, in case they you know, have any questions about your submission. Um, and then it is going to go out there and ask for um, the type of file. So obviously, if we were doing a test, we would use the test option. But when we're actually ready to do the actual one, we're going to select original, um, the TCC code. Um, has it been approved for combined federal state filing? If you've had that approved years ago, you would be saying yes to this. Is this prior year? I've never used that before. Um, so it's not if you just default through it, you're fine. Um, but if there was some reason you needed to create one from the prior year, you would have to enter in a P. And then basically this is a recap of what it's going to look like. So it's going to, so here's my input file. So when I appended that file for like calendar year 18, my append file could be F1099.18 underscore APP. Um, and then my actual output file that gets created from the TR1090 program is going to be irstax.dat. And then it just gives me all the information to review of all of the information that I entered in. So if that all looks good then, um, go ahead and generate it and it's going to create that irstax.dat file and also a tr1099.txt file. And so this is something that we keep on file then here at NAWACA um, so that we have a summary report of all the districts, their number of uh, 1099s that they've had and we just keep that on file. Um, uh, just for uh, audit purposes, so we have all that information on there. And so that output file then um, will need to be submitted to the IRS versus the fire system. And so these are the instructions then to go in and um, submit it. So usually, uh, you know, last year we kept, you know, our ID numbers, our passwords and everything so we know exactly what we need to do to get in, so I'm sure you guys all have your little instructions of what you guys do to submit your data to the IRS on behalf of your districts. We here in Milwaukee do the same thing. Um, so you just want to make sure that you keep a copy of everything as well as, you know, that TR-1099 uh, text file that gets generated. One more thing I want to cover um, before I turn it over to Lori is I just want to recap of what we've um, done this past year in regards to any updates that we've made in Classic. And so I'm kind of going from the most recent and then back up to the end of the fiscal year. And the one way we've already talked about is those numeric fields being accounted for under the name one and name two. Um, so that was an oops patch we sent out back in October. And that was slide 19 where I talked about that. Um, back in September, AutoRec was updated to accommodate the second line of the paying name, paying name two, um, which is an optional field, but some banks um, like Huntington um, have recommended or required that they have to have that on there. So we updated both PayRec and AutoRec for that. Um, so the AutoRec um, executable file was out there in OOPS and it was bat underscore autorec.exe. So if you hadn't done that yet, it should still be out there in the OOPS file um, where you can uh, run that to update that. And there's one for PayRec as well. On July 25th, the checkbook, um, we were having problems with the checkbook program. The authentication message, um, it wasn't sending it to the place it needed to go down there in Columbus. Um, so. We um, updated that because it's something on our software's end that we needed to resolve. So uh, we made an update to the FTP process in order to allow that data to be sent. So that's been out there as well since July. It's bat underscore checkbook.com. And then 
right before the end of the fiscal year, and I'm sure you guys are all well, well aware of this because of the redesign, we had to make an update in Classic regarding the prevention of backdating of invoices to a, using a prior fiscal year date. We have restricted that in Classic now because we were having issues with carryover balances, not balancing the Classic uh, with the redesign. So we have restricted that now so districts cannot backdate an invoice into a prior using a prior fiscal year date. So that was, um, I think the, those, I think four are the only ones that we've done here since um, fiscal year end. Okay. Any questions? Hey, yes. It's Deb at Mozeka. Yes. And Deb. Um, now that people have their gap auditors, they're dealing with them right now, I've had a couple of questions about the payable report. Like mm -hmm. they feel like they did everything they were supposed to do as far as using a receive date in July or August or whatever, and but the payable report isn't reflecting um, that it's not creating. Is any, I didn't know if anybody else had any experience with that. I'm wondering, Deb, if when, you know, before they were, you know, it was allowing them to backdate the invoice date, you know, in AP invoice, and then that invoice date was pop was automatically populating the receive date with that same June date. Well, if now because we're preventing that from happening, I wonder whatever you know they're putting it's forcing them to put in a July date as the invoice date that receive date. If they don't go in and manually change the receive date on the line items of that invoice, it's still going to reflect whatever their invoice date was. So they're putting in a July invoice date now. Those received dates are going to show July. So they would have had to have gone in and manually changed those received dates to June dates in order for the payables to create a report correctly. So I'm just wondering if they missed that. They forgot to do that. I think that's probably it. Well, they said they didn't, but I, I have a report I can send you to see if that right. makes sense. But yeah. Yes. Thank you. Go ahead and send that, and we'll take a look at it. All right. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? One thing, I don't see anything in chat. One thing I just wanted to point out here underneath the question slide here is that we are planning, planning on having our calendar year end webinar for the redesign on the 30th. I, that might change, I don't know at this point, but that's what, what, that's what we're sticking to. Um, the registration link is right there, um, and the webinar materials, like I said, will be available on that trainings page that I already showed you. Um, probably want to wait until closer to the meeting to download anything because Lori and I are feverishly going in there. Well, Lori's doing a much better job than I am. <laughs> I'm getting those uh, those um, checklists and PowerPoints and stuff out there. So we haven't, um, so we're still working on that stuff. So I'd wait until closer to the 30th to get that information. Uh, but I do have um, the link and everything there to get that info. All right. Thanks, everybody. I'm going to go ahead and mute for a sec, and then Lori's going to continue on.
Good morning, everybody. All right, we're going to go through the payroll part of this. Um, if anybody has questions uh, when I'm when I'm going through all this, please feel free to you know enter them in chat or just you know unmute your phone and ask. That's fine. I'm not too formal on that. So. Um, Again, like uh, Michelle had made the comment before, uh, the new filing, the filing, I shouldn't say new, the filing deadline again for this year is January 31st. So it's going to be up to each ITC as far as the date that they want to uh, tell the district that they need to have their uh, data finished by. So you can get the appropriate information and get that, uh, the, the information appended into a file and able to make your submissions to uh, the SSA and the state. So I'll go ahead and we're going to go through kind of like the uh, the, the pre-W-2 stuff and then balancing problems and we'll talk about creating the, uh, the tape files and I'll kind of give you an example of like what we do here. So uh, we'll go ahead and start with the, uh, uh, we're talking about the new filing deadline, W-2 maintenance program. So W-2 maint is actually, actually used to create a file that the district can actually upload to the SSA. And what it does, it's basically uh, checking social security numbers to verify that they're correct before you actually start your um, W-2 submission in, uh, information. So what the district can do is go into the W-2 MATE program in the payroll system, and they're going to use option one, which is the SSA EVS option. And what will happen is they'll actually get a file created that has the information that they want on it. Now, the W-2 MATE program allows them to tell, the, tell them they, they want to create an electronic submission file, and all they have to do is just enter an E in that prompt. And then if they wanted to select all the employees, they could just leave the termination date, hire date, and last pay date blank. If they wanted to narrow it down and only pull in everybody that was, you know, last paid on their last pay date, they could enter that in, or the termination date, or if they have a particular hire date they want to use, they could enter that information in. So once they do that and, and do the processing, they're going to get a file, an EBSREQ2K.SEQ file, that they're going to actually take and upload to the SSA. Now, in order to do that, they do have to have a login to the SSA website. Um, but once they have that, they can go ahead and upload this file to the SSA website. And then the SSA is going to go through their file, ver make verification, make sure the Social Security numbers are correct. And then what they're going to do is they're going to return a file to the district if the, with any with errors on it. So like everything will be on the file, but if there's errors, I think the errors are normally at the top of the page of the file. So when that file comes back, it's got some strange uh, formatting as far as the name of the file. So normally what has to happen is if the user is capable, they have to go in and rename that file, ES, ESV, e, I can't talk, EVSVR2K.SEQ. If they're unable to do that, the ITCs can help them basically get that file renamed. What they're going to have to do first is they're going to have to make sure that they get that file in their directory. So they'll have to transfer or FTP it from their desktop or wherever they saved it into their directory, and then you at the ITC can actually go in and just rename that file if they haven't already been able to rename it. So once they've done that or once you've renamed that file for them, they can go back into W2 main and they're going to run option two, which is the EVSRTN option. And when they do that, they're going to go in and they're going to put that file name in there. And then what will happen is they'll get a, a report that will show them any errors that are out there regarding any employee and maybe a Social Security number is incorrect or something like that. So this will actually help them with, with having the, that part of it already taken care of before they actually get ready to do submissions of the W-2s. So it kind of is a... A, they're being proactive as far as making sure that those social security numbers are correct before they submit something that's incorrect and then it gets rejected. 
Um, another thing that we tell our districts, and you're going to want to tell your districts as well, is to make sure, and this is something we talked about last year, but I'll, I'll talk about it again in case, you know, they had a new school district income tax that they added. Um, they want to make sure on the dead name record that they go into the W-2 abbreviation field and they'll enter in the four-digit OSDI code and then, you know, whatever the school district name is because the, the state of Ohio basically asked last year that this be done because I think what was happening is a lot of people were putting in, in the W-2 abbreviation for school districts, um, Archibald. Okay, well, if there's an Archibald city tax, then they had Archibald in there too. Well, they're getting the W-2s and it says Archibald and then it says Archibald. They can't distinguish between the two. So they're making sure that they have that OSDI code in front of you know, the word Archibald. Obviously, the whole word isn't going to come through, but at least they have the OSDI code to, de to basically define that, that it's a, a school district income tax. So you want to make sure that your districts go in and verify that all of the uh, OSDI records have the W-2 abbreviation information on it. Another thing for um, any, any district that has specific cities, because like here, we have per certain cities that we submit our district's data for. Um, we have maybe like seven or eight of them that we do. Well, in order for us to be able to create a file for that, the district has to make sure that the entity code on the dead name record is populated because we're actually using that data when we're pulling out the information for those particular cities. So you, they want to make sure that if they have any specific cities that you're actually creating a file for, for the districts, that they have those entity codes populated on the dead name city records. And so here is a good, an example of a city record, and this is where the tax entity code is located. Uh, for CCA and RETA reporting, the district's going to want to verify in the dead name record that they have the RETA code or the CCA code uh, for the data to be included in the submission file. Uh, if we go out here, you can basically see this is an example of a city record. And so on those city records, we have a RETA field where you actually enter in the code information, and then you have to basically put in a yes or a no, and then uh, the name of the city underneath the, the, the read, like a, here is example, underneath the RETA code or CCA code. Um, if it's a, a, a record that gets reported to RETA or CCA, we want to make sure that on the deduction screen record, there's an, a field that says employee, employee slash residence. We want to make sure that that field is populated with the correct code, whether it be the employment code, which is a C, or uh, the resident code, which is an R. So why are they paying this tax? Do they re reside in the city or are they employed in the city? We want to make sure that that information is on this record in the deduction screen. So again, that's something that the districts right now can actually be going out and double checking before they actually start working on their W-2 processing. Um, the health savings accounts, this should already be set up, but if it's not, we want to make sure on the dead name record that they have the annuity type of I specified because um, that is basically defined for an HSA deduction. So uh, even if there's no employee amounts withheld, you're going to want to make sure that you have that record set up because maybe they only have employer amounts withheld. You still want to make sure that that annuity type is defined with an I. And here's an example of a dead name record and then the, the Section 125 Health Savings Account uh, code of I, which is for the annuity type. Um, employee expense reimbursements. Uh, if the district wants to, uh, like, like, wants to show an amount that was paid through a warrant on the W-2 as wages, we have an actual supporting document out there um, in the on the uh, website that's called uh, reimbursement of employee or I'm sorry, employee expense reimbursement, I can't even say it, 
if, if, you, if the district wants to do that, they're going to want to go ahead and take a look at this document because it gives examples of like what they can do. And here's the document I'm, I'm referring to. So it has different scenarios like how if they want to, uh, if, the, if the employee was paid through a warrant check and they want the amount to appear on the W-2 as wages, but now in box 14 is fringe benefits, there's different options that they can use. And we have like six different scenarios on this document. So again, this document is out there accessible for you. Um, one thing that has changed for this year is the moving expenses option. Um, as of right now, the only moving expenses that are eligible to be reported on the W-2 are active military only. So if you have an employee that had moving expenses for this current school, for this current year, that's not going to actually be able to be added on to the W-2 for this year because they are only allowing anybody that was an active military employee to have moving expenses. So that's just kind of information to let you know so you can tell your districts that that is something that has changed. Um, if, we, if an employee has fringe benefits, uh, a lot of times we tell people to contact their legal advisor with questions to make sure um, that they're considered fringe benefits. But if you have fringe benefits, those can be entered um, on the 001, the federal tax record, in the fringe benefit field. Um, example, all tuition reimbursements, anything that's above uh, $5,250 is considered a fringe benefit. And that's going to be subject to taxation. So anything above that amount that was uh, expended for the employee, uh, we're going to have to make sure that we have that in the fringe benefit so it gets, it gets included on their taxes for the year. Uh, life insurance purchase for withheld annuities. So this is basically that uh, anything above 50,000 life insurance, we have the NC1 payment type option that districts can use for that. Um, so what they can do is be, before the last pay of the year or even now, whenever they want to do it, they could go in and put in an NC1 pay type and that will actually be processed correctly as far as like taxation purposes for what needs to be taxed. Um, again, the NC1 pay type doesn't add anything to the employee's check. It only helps to, um, as far as uh, it taxes it for like federal, state, Medicare for W-2 purposes. Now, um, if they did not enter an NC1 payment before the last pay of the year, they're going to have to go in and they will have to basically manually make corrections to the, the uh, federal record, the state record, school district record, if the, if, um, or, and city, if, those, if the city uh, is applicable, if they actually tax those kind of uh, withholdings. So, in this uh, document here, we basically it tells them what all needs to be updated, what fields they need to actually go in and manually update in order to get that life insurance information included on the W-2. <clears throat> and then if they, may, if they did not do an NC-1 pay type, like I said, before the end of the, the year, and they did a manual addition or manual correction to all of those records, they're going to go into the 001 federal deduction record and add the life insurance cost on that record in the life insurance cost field. Um, another thing is dependent care. Uh, the district may already have a deduction set up for dependent care. Uh, if they don't have a dedu dependent care deduction set up, they're going to have to manually enter the dependent care amount on the federal tax, the federal O1 deduction record in the dependent care field. Uh, the maximum for dependent care is $5,000 uh, for married, uh, $2,500 if you're filing separately. Now, they're going to enter in the dollar amount for the dependent care. So let's just say that they entered in $6,000 they're going to actually be taxed on $1,000 because the max is 
So again, they're going to have to enter that information on the dependent care line on the federal 001 record. If they use a company vehicle, the same thing's going to apply. They have to go out to that federal 001 record and enter the dollar amount for the vehicle lease on that vehicle lease line, and that will be taxed accordingly um, when, when the W-2 is processed. Uh, Employer-sponsored health care costs. There's a few different things with this. Uh, if the employee is paying their insurance um, through the system, through the payroll system, and the board is paying it through the payroll system, you're great. You're fine and dandy. As long as the dead name record is set up with that um, included employer-sponsored health care field, as long as that field is marked yes, then that information will be put on the W-2 accordingly. Um, a few different scenarios we have set up here. If an employee is paying for their insurance out of pocket, uh, that'll need to be manually added to the employer health field on the employer 001 deduction record. So let me go back here. This employer health field, it's in the middle of the screen here. If the employee is paying out of pocket for a portion of their employer, uh, the employer or their, their health insurance, that dollar amount is going to have to be put in that employer health field on the 001 record. Um, the same thing holds true. Say the, the, they're paying portion, the board's paying portion. You're going to have to add both both figures together, and that's going to actually be what's, what's put in that employer health field on the 001 record. Keep in mind that employer health field overrides anything else that's out there. So let's just say that the employee already has uh, an employer health deduction set up, but you go in and you populate that employer health coverage field on the 001 record, whatever is in that field is what's going to be used for the W-2. Another scenario if the employee pays half of their uh, insurance and the other was processed through payroll, again, you're going to have to uh, put that information on that employer health coverage field on the 001 record. You may have to add the amount paid in payroll with the amount that they paid themselves and put that as a total for the employer health coverage field. Um, if the district only tracks the employee amount in the payroll system and then they process everything for the board through USAS, this could be another reason that you're going to have to use an employer health coverage field on the 001 record, you're going to have to take the dollar amount that the employee paid plus the dollar amount that the board paid, put it on a spreadsheet, add it together, and you could actually take that and use USP load to load all that information into the employer health coverage field on the 001 record. Now, something to keep in mind that you can tell your districts is if they don't, okay, let's just say that they, only, they always just process the board portion of employer health coverage through USAS. They don't run it through payroll. That's fine. But what they can do is they could actually have that set up in payroll for the employer, the, uh, the employee's deduction. They could have a board portion on there as long as they don't have on the dead name record an object code listed. When they process board distribution, it's not going to pull anything over, but at least it would, it would, you'd still have your employer and employee amounts, and so there would then be no, no problem as far as like having to create a spreadsheet with the, with the board amounts, adding the employer amounts to it. You wouldn't have to do all that. You wouldn't have to load that into the employer health field because the employee portion and employer portion is already tracked in the system. So that's just something to keep in mind for your districts. And again, when we have that employer health coverage field marked on the dead name record, there's those, the boxes on those uh, 500 or 600 records, and it says, uh, is this employer sponsored health care? If those are marked as yes, then what's going to happen if those are marked as yes or anything that's in that 001 federal record on the employer health field? It's going to actually get pulled in on the, the W-2. It's going to go into box 12 with the code of DD. So that gets included. And that's going to be for any district that file with 250 or more employees. They have to make sure that they have that information in for the employer-sponsored health care. 
Uh, remember to keep in mind that life and dental, life, dental, and vision are not required to be included if they're if they're on separate plans. Um, so that's one thing to keep in mind. I have a link here too that kind of explains a little bit more about you know what all should be reported. Um, and then anything as far as health savings accounts, that is not to be included as employer-sponsored health care because that's a totally different code on the, D, on the W-2. So we got to make sure that on those dead name records, they do not have that field marked as employer-sponsored health care because that's, like I said, a totally different code. That goes in box 12 with the code of W. Okay, we kind of talked about this already as far as that flag, the include uh, employer-sponsored health coverage on the regular annuity record. And then here's an example of a, of a deduction name screen. There's that, uh, that field, so they would actually have a yes on that field if, as an, if it was an employer-sponsored health coverage field or coverage deduction. And I kind of already talked about all of this. Employer health field, we talked about that. I get talking ahead of myself here, I get ahead of the slides, so um, we talked about that. We talked about that using USP load if they had to load it into the health coverage field. And we talked about if they're not processing it, uh, the board portion through payroll, that they could do that. And this kind of explains all of that. We have that health reimbursement arrangement. That was new for last year. Um, it's something that we feel probably none of the school districts are really using, but they did include it. So this is just a little bit of an explanation of what that field is. And we actually have that field on the federal 001 record if there is for some reason a district that is using that health reimbursement option. We do have that included on there. And that right uh, on this here, here, this is a uh, screenshot of the O1 federal deduction record. And that health reimbursement field is right on the record. It's kind of in the middle of the record. Okay, so districts, like I said, they're going to run the W2 main, get things done with that. They can make sure, you know, of all of the information as far as city records, school districts, et cetera. They could actually right now be running W-2 prac, and a lot of times they run it every month anyway just to make sure there's no errors that have occurred. But they can actually run W-2 prac before that last pay of 2018, uh, and they, they can take and balance their information and then review and correct any warnings or errors that they're getting. They can kind of be proactive and jumping on that and making sure that everything is corrected before they get ready to actually process the W-2. Uh, the W-2 PROC program is going to actually create the W-2 report, which is used for balancing, and then when they go in and actually run W-2 PROC and say, yes, they want to create the submission file, it actually creates uh, W-2 uh, uh, files for them to print, and then a, uh, print forms, sorry, and then W-2 DAT files that are used for your laser printing with EDGE. Um, there's a W2City.dat file that, it, that gets created that's used for, again, we talked about special sub, uh, city submissions. And then the W2Tape file is actually used for uh, submissions to the SSA, to the state, and then usually for RITA and CCA. We use that, that W2Tape file for submissions to all of those. Um, when they run W-2 proc, they're going to get prompted to enter the, the, the district name and address. That actually pulls them automatically from the uh, USP con screen. The ID numbers as well, pull, they all pull in uh, the same thing. The only thing, they want to make sure that everything is, is valid, you know, that obviously it pulls in, but if something is wrong, we need, they, a correction needs to be made before they actually create the W-2s. So they can decide how they want to sort those W-2s, and a lot of times they're sorting uh, if they want to sort, you know, by name or by building or whatever, they can do that. And then a lot of times with our districts, we tell them, you know, when you're sending, when you're doing the sorting option, when you send us the information for us to print, tell us how you want those to be printed out. And a lot of times in the Edge software, you have the capability of changing the uh, the printing or the, the way that it's sorted when you're printing. 
and these are just screenshots of like what the W-2 PROC actually looks like. If they have third-party payer information, they can enter the federal the, the uh, federal tax amount withheld, if any, on this document or in that field. The kind of employer that's important. This has been around for a little while. Uh, normally, most districts are the S, which is the state and government employer, which is the non 501 c There could possibly be maybe some community schools that might be the Y, which is the state employer, uh, state and local tax exempt employer. Again, they would have had to have filed for tax exempt status, so they would have had to have that 501 c uh, pop, you know, basically filled out and approved and everything before they're actually considered tax exempt. Um, then again, the user has to enter the district data. We talked about that, which comes from the U.S. account screen. When they're actually creating the tape file themselves, they're going to be actually prompted with a few other prompts on there. One of them is the contact name. This field is required. They have to enter the information. So more than likely, they could put in their own name in this field, in the, in the contact name field. Um, if they have additional deduction codes that they want to show up on box 14, which is the other, they can enter that in. Um, keep in mind that vehicle lease is always going to be on there. So if they have a vehicle lease, that's going to be number one on box 14. And then it will also print two other ones besides it. So in total, it will print up to three deductions on inbox 14 for an employee. So if they had a vehicle lease and then you had uh, entered in maybe the union dues or you know some other deductions, maybe STRS or whatever, it's going to show vehicle lease, union dues, STRS, and then if there's other deductions, those aren't going to show up. It's going to show those first three. Uh, the alignment forms, would you like to print a dummy alignment? Basically, what happens if they say yes to that uh, on their W-2s? There's a blank W-2 when it starts printing, and then, you know, the, the, the first W-2 will print after that. Uh, again, here's your uh, information where they could actually enter up to six deduction codes for box 14 if they want to. When they get the W-2 report, that report should balance to the, the, to the 941 totals, the earnings register, earnings sum figures, um, which represents the amounts that were withheld from the employees, the deductions, the quarter report figures, so that's the amounts as, uh, that would be listed in the current year-to-date figure. And then they're going to want to make sure that they balance the federal Ohio city taxes and the gross amounts, make sure that they do their balancing for all of that. And then we do have a, uh, a reconciliation worksheet out there on the link that, they, that you can actually, you know, if you want your districts to have that, they can definitely use that. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that the totals for the year-to-date, everything from first quarter to fourth, the year-to-date totals should equal um, that what's on the W-2 report total. So those figures should match. And then here's an example of uh, W-2 balancing. So um, on the earnings register, the deduction amount column uh, is used for balancing. So they're going to want to use that column when they're doing their balancing from the earnings register. When they're using the quarter report, they're going to be using the year-to-date uh, totals amount. And they're using the W-2 report, they're going to be using the amounts in the column as far as like the total uh, withholding for that particular, on that particular report. Um, the W-2 balancing, there, are, there could be items or things that affect the balancing between W-2 PROC and quarter report, and what those could be are, could be listed on the specific effects document, which we have listed out there. It's actually out there on the, on the link. You can actually pull that up. What that does is it kind of explains to you, let me pull up that document so you can kind of see it here. Pull it over. Oops, didn't pull it over. Here we go. Okay, so this basically lists for you, like if somebody had adoption assistance, 
how it's going, how it should be processed, how it will be processed, and then what's exempt to what's not exempt. And it pretty much goes through all the different scenarios, like your life insurance, it goes through your dependent care, and up here it tells you the items in bold uh, affect balancing between W-2 proc and quarter report, so bold italics. So down here, dependent care, that's going to affect the balancing between your W-2 proc and quarter report. So those are the kind of things to keep in mind when they're actually doing, actually doing their balancing. Let's back over here. And here on this W-2 balancing uh, slide, it tells you what, what basically will affect your balancing, your dependent care benefits over limit, fringe benefits, Medicare pickup amounts, taxable third-party sick pay, company vehicle use, employee expenses reimbursement through pay, pay through warrant. So those are kind of things to keep, keep in mind that if you're having balancing issues, look at these because it could be possible that they had some, one of these scenarios. This kind of just explains all the different things that are making your balancing, you know, not match. So here's your dependent care benefits over the limit of $5,000. So this tells you, you know, what it adds, uh, what feels it adds a total as far as like adds that additional, I can't even say it, additional money over the $5,000. <laughs> Michelle's laughing at me here. <laughs> so it tells you like, um, Here's an example. So if 6,000 was added to the dependent care, um, 1,000 is going to get added to the total and taxable gross field on, those, on that particular record. And that means it's going to make the growth on the W-2 look higher than the quarter report because basically it doesn't do anything with the quarter, it's only doing it to the year-to-date information. Oops. So here's your dependent care field. Then we have fringe benefits. That's another thing. If you added fringe benefits on the federal record, it's going to make the W-2 report appear higher than the quarter report. Your Medicare pickup, another thing that will cause that W-2 report to appear higher than quarter report. Uh, keep in mind, if on the city record, if the tax board amount is not used, if it's not marked on the city record, on the dead name record, the tax Medicare FICA pickup should be yes if the city taxes the Medicare pickup. The Medicare pickup is added to the city total and tax amounts on the W-2 report, but the employee is paying the taxes after the fact because that tax board amount option was not marked. And here's the, what I'm talking about. The tax Medicare FICA pickup is yes, but you have no set up for the tax board amount. If the tax board amount is used, if it's set to yes, then the taxes are actually going to be withheld during the payroll. So uh, just to know, the tax Medicare FICA pickup field is not used and is replaced by the tax board amount field um, if they're using that tax board amount field and then they have to, have to actually populate the particular deduction codes in that field in order for that to process correctly. So here's what I'm talking about with the tax board amounts. If it's set to yes and they have the particular deduction codes, it will actually tax the, tax the, um, the pickup for those deductions as well as add it to the employee's totals. Uh, the taxable third-party sick pay uh, if you get a document from a third-party vendor, uh, you, you had, the district has to know, is, is this third-party sick pay taxable? Is it not taxable? If it's taxable, then the district is going to have to go in, and this kind of is a document. You can't read it really well, but we do have it out there in the, in the supporting documents. It would be a little bit easier to read. It explains to you what you have to do in order to get that on the W-2 correctly, if, the, if it's taxable, because there's certain fields that you have to manually go in and update on the federal, the Ohio, the school district, the Medicare records. And one thing to keep in mind is if they do med the Medicare record and the third party didn't pay the Medicare tax, 
the district is more than likely going to have to pay Medicare tax for that third, for that third party uh, vendor amount that the employee received. Now, um, if they do that, the employee, most of the time the employer pays both the employee and employer portion. If they want to, you know, they could charge the employee and make them pay that back to them if they want to. It's up to the district what they want to do. Um, so this is, like I said, this is a third party sick pay document that explains tax, if it's non-taxable or taxable. Again, we have that out there in the supporting documents so you'd be able to read it. And then this is an example of like a third party uh, payment notification. And it kind of explains to you like if this field is populated, what fields you manually have to change on the particular deduction records in order to get that correct for tax and taxing purposes. If the, t if the third party sick pay is non-taxable, um, it does not affect balancing. It does not affect the taxes. All the district is going to have to do is go in and enter that amount that was paid by the third party vendor to the employee on the federal 001 record in the third party pay field. They have to enter it there. And then when they do that, it will actually show up in box 12 on the W-2 with the code of J. Uh, use of a company vehicle, that's another thing like we talked about earlier. If you're having issues with W-2 balancing, that, that vehicle lease information is going to make the W-2 report appear higher than your quarter report. Uh, employee expense reimbursements. Again, that's another one that you're actually going in and you're making you're making manual changes to like your federal, your state, et cetera. So with that being said, more than likely the W-2 report is going to appear higher than your quarter report because you basically went in and made changes to your year to date totals and your quarter to date totals weren't changed which would make your difference between your quarter report and your W-2 report. Um, if the district is having balancing problems, uh, one thing they can look at are, is uh, voided checks from a prior calendar year. What they could do is run a check status report to look for any voided checks. Uh, a refund of an annuity from a prior calendar year, they could go in and run an audit report see if maybe they uh, have anything entered in uh, as an error adjustment. Um, any manual updates that were made, they could run an audit report and then they could search on the audit report for YTD for year-to-date information, anything that might have been changed on that audit report. So they can definitely do that and, you know, see if any changes were made manually. Um, here's a screenshot of the W-2 report. And this basically gives a breakdown of like where each of these fields are pull, or what what is it, is actually being used for W two processing. So like your information for your like for your special uh, information as far as like uh, your four hundred three Bs, your four fifty sevens, anything like that, that is going to be special amounts for the W two. So that's used on the W two. The uh, description for W-2 boxes on the dead name record, that's where this information comes from. So like we talked about earlier, the OSTI W-2 abbreviation field, when you have that populated, this is where that is coming from on this W-2 report. Uh, the tax withheld is coming from the deduction screen as well as your taxable growth and your total growth. All three of those things on your W-2 report are coming from the deduction screen. And then the annuities is a, is a calculation. It's the calculated growth minus any taxable growth. Uh, another W-2 uh, error message is the calculated annuity amount exceeds the total annuities. So what that's telling us is that the total growth minus the taxable growth is greater than the total number, total dollar amount on the annuities uh, for the, for the year-to-date deductions. So what that means is that possibly there's a problem with the annuity amount, the growth, or the taxable growth. 
So again, that's probably something they're going to want to look at the audit report and verify that maybe no manual updates were made or any error adjustments might have been made. They can use the audit report to find that out. An invalid SSN, well, if they ran W2 mate, hopefully they shouldn't have an invalid SSN because um, if they do and they try to and you try to submit the file for them, you're going to probably get a rejection. Um, what normally we have districts, we tell them to verify the SSN uh, on the on the Social Security card to verify that it matches. If for some reason, let's say you get back the verification from the SSA and there is an incorrect Social Security number, the district's going to have to go in and use the Mass Change Program, the Change SSN option to change that, update that social security number to be the correct social security number. So if they got the insurance or the social security card from the employee and they now have the correct social security number, they're going to use mass chain to change that incorrect number to the correct number. Again, they can get all that done before they actually process their W-2s. Another error message that they might get is uh, the Medicare amount does not equal 1.45% of the Medicare gross. So <clears throat> what that's meaning is the Medicare tax, it might be incorrect, so you're going to want to have the district verify their amounts. Um, again, this is something that the um, SSA, they won't accept the file if there's incorrect amounts. So you're going to have to make sure that this is correct before we get the actual true submission file and we append that file. Uh, another thing that you can check is uh, Medicare taxable growth, make sure that that's correct. Make sure, you know, verify the amounts, uh, you know, run some audit reports, make sure there weren't any manual changes made to the record. You might have to possibly run through the whole, uh, an earnings register for the whole year, and then maybe, uh, maybe some Medicare has to be paid. The district may end up having to pay it if, uh, if you know, the last pay was processed already. So those are the kind of things, again, you're going to want to do all this, make sure that, you know, ahead of time, as long as you don't get these errors, um, running W-2 proc early enough will help clean up these errors before it's actually time to start processing W-2s. Uh, here's uh, some information as far as, like, what they need to do so they can verify manual updates. We just talked about that. And they can check their pickup amounts. Maybe the employer has Medicare pickup. Make sure all that's correct. And what it could be, too, is, it could be an employee that started out, they were paying their Medicare, then the, then the employer was paying it. Maybe there's something within that um, switchover that happened. Another error message that districts get is there's a negative annuity on file for the employee. Uh, normally that happens when there was a refund uh, from a prior year of an, of an annuity. So if uh, they want to report, to, if they want to report the basically the refund of the money was held in return in the current calendar year. I mean, as long as it's not some ungodly amount, you know, if it's hundreds of thousands of dollars, they probably won't be able to do this. They're probably going to have to file a W2C. But if they wanted to actually just show, like, like uh, withheld and refunded in the current year, they could go into the deduction screen and zero out the annuity amount. And then on the deduction screen on the federal record state, school district and city if, if, they, if they tax um, the annuity, they could go in and increase the year-to-date growth. Um, and then also they're going to want to make sure that they, they increase year-to-date growth on the job, the third screen of job screen as well. Because if you do it on the deduction record, but you don't do it on the, the uh, job screen record, when they run quarter reports, they're going to be off by probably that dollar amount. Another error message is a retire plan box flag on the federal record is overriding W-2 proc calculations. So if the federal or the federal record has uh, the uh, pension plan box marked with a no, but they find an active retirement record, you could get the error. If the federal record has the flag marked as yes, but it doesn't find an active retirement record, you possibly could get this error. Uh, most of the time, the error you're getting it is for what uh, you have a student that you're paying and they don't participate in the retirement portion. And if that's the case, there's nothing that needs to be done. 
if it's not, then you definitely make, need to make some corrections to the employee in order to get that, rid of that error. Another error is possible error in this OSDI gross or tax. Uh, this indicates the taxable OSDI wages are out there, but there's no tax withheld. And this happens a lot with uh, employees who have very small wages. So all the district would need to do is just verify the amounts, and then usually they don't have to do anything as far as making corrections or anything to that employee. This, this error message is probably the most frequent. Total annuities do not equal total gross plus taxable gross. So the calculated annuity amount, uh, total gross plus the taxable, does not match the year-to-date annuity amount from the deduction screen. Uh, what this system does is it compares the total annuities to the total gross plus taxable gross using the ta federal tax record. Uh, so there could be a problem with the annuity total or the total gross or the taxable gross. So what they're going to want to do is they're going to want to go in, run an auto report, verify any, any manual changes, verify any refund of deductions. And again, if the refund was from a prior calendar year and they want it to appear um, if the amounts were, re were withheld and refunded in the current calendar year, they can do that by going in and increasing the total gross on the federal Ohio school district and, and city records, if applicable to city, if they initially honored the annuity. So remember to tell the district only increase the total gross because when they do the refund, the taxable gross already gets updated, but the total gross does not. So that's basically what's producing the error. So you have to make sure that it's just the total gross that gets updated. Um, another error message, and this is a fatal, um, the, Medicare, the employee's Medicare wages are less than the Social Security wages. So the Medicare wages um, are incorrect on the FICA record. So you have to update the gross amount on the deduction screen that has the incorrect amount. So you have the Medicare or the FICA record, one of them is incorrect. The Social Security Administration will contact the district if the error is not fixed. So again, that's a message. They're going to be getting a fatal. They should be able to go out and make the corrections and get that fixed before the file is even submitted. Um, if we want more explanation, because there's lots of other errors, you can go out. We have a document out there as well with the W-2 errors and uh, W-2 PROC and W-2 error list. So you can go out and look at that as well. And then I'm kind of not going to go over this too much because you guys can read, obviously. Um, but this pretty much just talks about like W-2 instructions reviewed. Uh, and here's the, uh, the link for that. And also we have the, a document out there for all the general instructions for the W-2 and W-3. And then all of these corresponding uh, pages talk about where particular things are found in this document. And these are just particular things that we think are of, of importance. One thing I'm going to talk about, uh, I went past it, deceased employees. We do have a supporting document out there um, that actually tells a district what needs to be done for deceased employees. So pretty much throughout the whole year, if they had a deceased employee, they would have probably already used this information. But in case they didn't, they're going to go out, they can look at this information um, because a 1099 and a W-2 normally need to be processed if, if the death occurred within the calendar year, and then if not within the calendar year, just a 1099. So it kind of talks about, about that a little bit in more detail. Um, I'm going to skip through again these instructions reviewed. We don't need to talk about all of those. I don't think you want me to sit there and read all these to you. <laughs> because it just talks about the different codes and different boxes on the W-2. And again, that's another document that we have out there. We have uh, a document that explains all of the, w the boxes on the W-2, what goes in every field or every box. So that's all out there as well. Um, Post-W-2 processing. Corrections before the files have been submitted to the SSA. So let's just say that you as the ITC have not submitted your district, your information, your file yet to the SSA, and a district calls up and says, oh, I need to make a correction. Again, 
This is an ITC decision, whether you want to let them make the correction now <laughs> or just let make them file a W-2 and W-3C. But with us, a lot of times, I mean, if it's early enough, grand, I mean, if it's right within the deadline, we're probably not going to let them do it. But if it's early enough, what we normally do is we have um, what we call a D account. And a lot of times, the districts use that D account. I'll give you the, the reason why and then also another reason that we use it. Um, if a district is not ready to process their W-2s yet, but they have a payroll coming up for January and they have to get that payroll done, what they can do is we have a checklist and it explains what they, can, what they need to process in order to get their files created in a D account. We basically copy their live file information to a D account, which allows them to go ahead and get their, their uh, pay for January process, and then after that's done, they can go back into this D account and then work on processing their W-2s. So with that being said, this D account can also be used, let's just say that you have a district that they process their W-2s in their live account, they went in and did their January payroll, blah, blah, blah. Well, when they're doing their W-2 processing, they follow the checklist. They're making a copy of their live files. Well, that copy of their live files could be taken and put into this D account, say that they may need to make a correction. They could actually have that, you could, they could have that file out there. You as the ITC can copy those files into the D account and let them process the W-2, make their correction to whoever it was in the D account and then run W-2 proc and create their W-2s from this D account. And then, you know, maybe the, you had one person that, you, that they had to correct. Well, the, you as the ITC could print out the new W-2, send it to them, et cetera. The only thing that you have to keep in mind, and normally we have like a spreadsheet here that we keep track because, like I said, we have districts that use their live files. We have districts that use this D account. So we have to keep track of which account they're actually using for their W-2 processing because when we get to the point where we're appending all of the districts into one to make that one file, we have to know, okay, District A, they process out of their live file. District B process out of their D file. So when we're pulling that data, we have to pull di District A is from their live, District B is from their D. We have to make sure we're getting the correct information. So you want to make sure that you some way keep track of that. I mean, if you allow your district to use like an archive or like we use a D account, you have to make sure that you do that. So again, if you want to allow them to make corrections, they can do that as long as you haven't submitted this, the file to the SSA. If you've already submitted the file, then they're going to add, the district's going to actually have to go in and process a W-2C and a W-3C and submit that on their own because you've already made, they've, you've already submitted the file for them. There is a W-2C program in payroll that they can process just so it helps them a little bit. Um, there's no way of like printing out a W-2C, but it, at least it could go in and process it. It will give them the information that they're going to need to actually put on this W-2C. Um, just so they have that information. Then we have the preparing for 2019. Uh, if there was any rate changes, tax rate changes for maybe your cities or your school districts, the district is gonna to wanna to go in. Obviously, they're gonna to have to wait until after their last pay of December is done, but then they can actually go in and start making those rate changes for their first January payroll. We have links out here for city tax rates, school district tax rates. So the district may want to go out there if they have school districts or certain cities and verify that what is being withheld for, for 2019 is still correct. Another thing, too, they're going to want to double check are the CCA city rates and the uh, RITA city rates. Again, we have links out there so they can go out and double check those rates, make sure no changes are needed. 
Um, and they can also go out to this findyourtaxohio.gov site if they're not sure if an employee should be taxed for a school district. They could go out to this link and then they can look up the tax rate for them, that particular school district uh, if they know the employee address, the zip code. If they have the longitude and latitude, they could put that in too. I'm sure a lot of districts have that information, but if they do, they can put that in as well. Now, if they're going to have to make uh, rate changes, they could go ahead and use that change dead program that we have out there. They could just go in and run change dead, and then they would go in and use the employee amounts option, which is C. They could go in and make that change. And then what happens is when they use the C option, it'll ask them for the old rate, ask them for the new rate. It'll make the change on all of the records. It'll actually give you a report with every employee with the rate change information on it. They can do that using ChangeDud, or if they wanted to, they could load a spreadsheet, uh, create a spreadsheet with the new rate information, and then use USP Load to load that into the deduction screen record. It's up to the district how they want to do it. So that's pretty much basically our pre-W2 PROC information and running W2 PROC. Um, another thing that I'm going to show you is the creating of the W2 tape file. I, we have a document out there. That, again, this is, like Michelle has said, this is just how we process it here at Nawaka, but at least it gives you kind of an example of how it's done. If I can find it here, hold on, right here, okay. So creating the W-2 master tape file. So um, what we normally do, the first thing we normally do is create the SSA or the, the main W-2 tape file. Again, this tape file is used for submission to the SSA electronically. We burn a CD for the state of Ohio and then read it on CCA, but we'll go through all this. So first of all, we go in. Now, like, I just put in my information because, again, you can, you can kind of follow this and create it how you want. You probably already have something set up, but for anybody that's new, it just kind of gives you a little bit of an explanation. You go in and run pay W-2 tape, and then you're telling them that you're building it a master tape file for your federal and state submission. And then you say you want to uh, select from the following options, start building the master tape file, so you use an S. Then it asks you for your submitter EIN, and then they ask you if, you're, if that's correct when you type it in, and then it asks you for your submitter user ID, you enter that in, and then it asks you is that correct. And then it asks you if the, the file is being resubmitted, obviously it's not because we're, we're just creating the tape file initially, so we say zero for no. And then we have to enter the type of software using to create our uh, file which is uh, 98, the in-house program. And then you have to enter your company information. And so normally what I do, I enter in Northern Buckeye Education Council. You know, you would probably be entering in your ITC information. So you'd enter your ITC name, your address, the delivery address. And normally I populate both of those fields. I noticed when I did it last year for the first time, I was like, oh, this is wrong. So I actually put in my location address and the delivery address, same address, but I put it in both spots. And then your ITC city, state, zip, uh, if you have a zip extension, you put that in. Then it actually goes through, it wants you to verify if, you made, if everything is correct. If not, you can make a correction. Okay, and then, go down here, it'll ask you for the contact phone number. Okay, so I normally put in my phone numbers, and you have to make sure, I think it's phone number, email address, and your contact name. You have to have all of that information in. So you're gonna to wanna to put in the phone number, and then the email address. Or I missed the, there it is. <laughs> the submitter name. You gotta make sure you have that in there. And then the phone number and the email address, like I said. And then under the prepare code, which is going to be L, which is a self-prepared. And then um, you enter in your name. And then what it does, it gives you a verification of everything you entered in. 
And then if you need to change something, you can tell it, oh, I need to change field 18, and it will let you make a change to that field. Once you've gone in and said, yeah, everything looks good, did the tape master file is created, the w2mass.seq is created. Then at that point, what I go in and do is I go out to my district directories. So we have different directory like nodes or extensions. So I have to go in and I have to pull the data that I want, you know, for each of my districts. So I have to pull in from all the different um, directories that we have. I pull in the W2 tape. And you'll see at mine is called dot 18 underscore SEQ. When we're actually getting the information from the district, we, we will go in and we rename that, all their files to like, with a like dot 18 underscore whatever text or SEQ extension. That way, those files are always sitting out there. They're, they don't go away. And in case we need to use them for some other purpose, they're still sitting out there. So I go in and I pull in all of the data for my districts, with, and then I with, pull in the w2tape.18.seq file, pulling all that in. And over here it says should be XX. That's only for my own reference because I go through and I count up, okay, I'm supposed to have X amount on, from the FSA directory and, and X amount from the SFE. I verify and make sure I have that total amount once, it, once the files start create, getting created. So then I process the set host at the walk of four. And this, again, is something internal that I go in and do. And then I do the appending of all of these files. And I append those to a w2tape.seq.mass w2mass.seq slash new slash log. So I'm making a new uh, w2master sequential file. And then my w2mass is going to now contain all of my appended files. And then I will get an append.txt file report. I usually print that off and I have different folders that I save those to. So now I've printed off my append and I've appended all, appended all the files to the w2 um, mass.seq file. Now, to complete my W2 mass or tape, I have to go in and I run W2 tape again. And this time I'm going to tell it that I want to finish building the file after appending the tape files. So I say F to finish. And then it tells me that it's going to create a 6559 form. And then it asks me to enter the information again as far as the I, my ITC address, line one, address line two, my city, my state, my zip, and my area code and phone number. I enter all of that information in, and then all, all of the employees reside in, I say one, the United States. I don't have to put anything in this inventory number. And then I select the type of data that, I, that is being reported. This is all W2 original data, so I'm choosing option one. When I choose that, the W2 tape summary report is W2 tape.txt. I get a W2 659.txt. And then the tape file, I normally print that out. Okay. Then what I tape, do is my W2 mass.seq file is complete. I've started it, I've appended the files, and I've finished it. So I've created my file. You're going to go want to go out. And I forgot to change this where it says no AccuH can be downloaded from the Social Security website. That's not true anymore. You can just go out to the Social Security website and pull up AccuH. And then what you can do is transfer your file from wherever you have it. Like I usually have a W2 uh, 18 directory of my own. I transfer that file. But I have to make sure when I'm transferring it that I uncheck the delete trailing spaces because if you don't, you're going to get an error. It'll say something about 5, 12, but line, whatever. So you want to make sure that you uncheck the delete trailing spaces option. And then what I do is go into AccuAge and I pull that W2 mass.seq file in, into AccuAge to verify that there's no error before I actually submit it before I actually upload it to the SSA. If there's errors, I'm going to go in and make fix it. I could, if it's something real simple, I might be able to just go into the W2 math. Maybe there's somebody that has like 
a junior or senior or some weird thing, I could go in real easily and correct, correct it. The only problem is you want to make sure that you're real careful because you don't want to mess up the formatting because if you do, you're going to want, you're going to, want to take that file and, and re-upload it to AccuH to make sure it's, it's correct. And then once everything is corrected, then you're going to go in and actually electronically submit the file to the SSA. And so you log into the SSA Business uh, Services Online and then choose the report wages to Social Security option. Choose the submit or resubmit wage file option. Uh, follow the menu options. Choose a new W-2, W-3 for tax year 2018 and then, or previous tax year EF W-2 option. You're going to choose, obviously, the current year. Then you're going to find your W-2 math file wherever you have that located, the appended file, and then you're going to upload that. And then once you do that, normally you get like a submission document and inf like information. I always print that document out to make sure, you know, here's my proof, I submitted it. And then I usually check back periodically to see uh, what the status is on the submission. So that way I know, hey, the file's been uploaded, it's been accepted. And then here, I, like I said, I normally print out the W-2659 tech report. And then in my file, in my directory, I rename that tape file, the mass file, and the W-265-6559 all with a .18 extension. That way I have that information out there and then I just purge my directory. And then for, this, for the submission to the state, I basically am taking that W-2 mass, that 18 SEQ file that I have that I created and appended, and I'm burning that to a CD. And then I'm submitting that information to the state of Ohio. And again, I take and I print out copies of my W-2-6559 and then I actually have information here like what I actually do with those files as far as like I save one copy of a CD. So I burn a CD for, uh, for myself and then I burn a CD for the state. And then I include the CD, a uh, copy of the W-265-59 report and then the original IT3 forms. So what I've been, what I've always done is I require Tell our districts when we have our meeting, we tell them, send us your IT3 forms, anything that you submit for special cities, any uh, forms that you submit for special cities, we have them send all of that information to us. And then what I normally do is make copies of all of the IT3 forms, and then I have those in a file, that way I've got proof that, hey, these were sent, and then I include the original IT3 forms with my CD when I send that as well. And then I do the same thing when I do uh, the CCA and RITA. And so when we run the CCA and RITA, we're going to go in a little differently. You go to the W-2 tape program as well, but there's an option that you can run the C, which is for CCA. So you run the CCA option, and you, the process is kind of the same. You're just using the C option or the R option if you're running it for RITA and you're appending your files and then creating the tape file and then you're creating a W2 math CCA sequential file instead of a W2 math file. And again, I normally take these files once I get it and I, I still go out, I just go into AccuAge because all of these files have to be in the same format that the, is, uh, is required by the SSA. So I just go out to the SSA and I run AccuAge on that file as well. I do that for every file, for my SSA file, for my RITA, for my, my, S, uh, my uh, CCA, and then all of my city files. I do the same thing because, I, again, all of them require the same formatting. So I just basically do that and then that way I get all the, if there's any errors, I, get, I can fix those errors before I try to submit the file. And so then I uh, apply magnetic, magnetic media stickers to, uh, to the front and back of my envelope. I, I uh, rename the files, just like I did with the SSA. The same thing for RITA, going in, following these procedures, and then creating a CD, sending that to them as well. And then for specific cities, like I said, we have, uh, I don't know, eight 
seven, eight cities that we do our four districts. I go in, get the files, same thing. I'm appending the files. So I, I basically go in and I have like a city creation uh, document out there. I have that out there for you as well because it's a little different how we have to process it. But we run W2 tape just like we run it for SSA and then append the files accordingly. But we are pulling in the W2 tape under source city information. And again, all this information is listed in that document, how you can actually go in and get that uh, information created. And then running it, uh, running the W2 mass sequential file through AccuAge. Again, want to make sure there's no errors. You're going to do that. And then I just go ahead and do the same thing for my city records as far as like burning it to a CD, saving, uh, printing off particular documents, including that with my CD, making a copy for myself. That way I have everything up, uh, basic proof that everything has been submitted. So that's kind of how we do it. This, again, this is just an example of what we do here at Nawaka. And then uh, the, the checklist, again, those are out there on the web page. I have it in uh, PDF format as well as in a, a Word document, just so if you want to use it, you can actually go out, you know, make, make your own. And we kind of tell you right here, each IT is, ITC is encouraged to conform the checklist to their own specifications. You probably already have one, you know, that you're using, your districts are using, but you just want to make sure um, that they're using something. And I mean, I know with our districts, it doesn't matter how many times you tell them, follow the checklist, check off. For some reason, I don't know what it is, but the, like they'll start with one thing and then they skip around and it's like, no, follow the, in order. This is the way we should do it. So, you know, it never fails. You always have somebody that doesn't follow the rules. So, um, and again, we talk, kind of talked about this already with our, our uh, PowerPoints, but the processing the NC1 payments, it explains to them how to do that. Then their month end closing, which they normally always do. We have it all listed here, what they need to do. Their quarter end closing, again, we run down the whole quarter end closing process and this in this checklist so they shouldn't miss anything because they don't have to have separate checklists they have one checklist with all the information on it then we have our w2 processing checklist now we have it set up so if they're ready to process now if yeah if they're ready to process include uh, now they can go to step 18 which is here but if they're not they go down to step 18a Okay, and that's kind of like I was saying, if they are going to be so good, be using a different account to process their W-2s. So here's your 18A. This tells them what they're going to have to do. First thing they're doing is running, running their calendar copy process because they're going to actually be uh, doing copying their calendar information over copying all of their files to a calendar information. And then they're going to send the ITC the uh, a message telling them that they want to process their W-2s at a later time. Well, when they do that, we at Nawaka take that calendar copy information and that's when we create their D account, as we call it here. And then it explains to them that the, how they have to finish up. They have to run their quarter report and zero everything out and then continue with their January payroll. And then, what, and then it explains to them when they've completed their January pay, uh, pay and they're ready to process their W-2s, then they log into their archive account or their D account, and then they process. So it explains, again, if they want to process them now, if they want to process them later. It's up to the district how they want to do it. Um, again, you as the ITC, I don't know, like, if some of you do archive accounts or you just basically say, hey, nope, got to do it out of your live account, get it done before you do your January pay. It's up to them. But Again, I can't stress enough that the main thing that you have to remember is if you do allow them to use an archive or a D account or something like that, you have to make sure that you are tracking and know which account you're going to be pulling the data from. Because we've had it happen before, okay, a district went in, they processed their W-2s in their live account. All right? Great. So far, so good. Okay, so we're tracking that. It's in the live account. But then they're one of those districts who 
called us and said, oh, I made a mistake on so-and-so, okay, I, I, need to make, I need to give them a correct W-2, I want them to be right. So those are the ones that we actually took and we copied their file, that calendar file, to their D account. They went into their D account, made the correction to the employee, processed their W-2s out of there. With that being said, um, we're going to make sure we change that to show now they're using their D account, they're not using their live account because we want to make sure we pull the right file. Now, the only, it'll only affect, I mean, a lot, anything that will affect is, is if their dollar amount changes because we don't want to pull in the live file if they're going in and making corrections to, you know, uh, their total gross or maybe they, you know, didn't put in the life insurance over 50000 Those are all going to make, uh, be, be, be changes to dollar amounts on those records. So we got to make sure we're using the correct file when we're doing our append. So you just got to keep that in mind. And normally what has to happen if, the, if you do that, okay, they have that W-2 tape sequential file already in their live account. Well, now they've gone in and they've created it in their D account as well, or their archive account as well. Usually, I figure this out when I get ready and I go and start doing the appending, and then it pulls in their live account, and it pulls in the D account, I'm like, oh, darn. So I just have to go into their live account, and I just rename that W2, ta uh, W2 tape file to something like not use or something like that, just so it doesn't pull in when I'm doing my append. So just keep that in mind. Um, everything else, I think we've kind of discussed the, uh, not a lot of changes, like I said, as far as like moving expenses, that's a change, it can only be for military personnel and the reminder of the, of the filing deadline, January 31st. Um, I think that Rita CCA are February 29th, I'm pretty sure, uh, but state and federal are definitely January 31, so you have to keep that in mind. Um, the Social Security wage base for the year of 2018 was 128,400, but that is all done behind the scenes. Our programmer takes care of all of that. Um, I think that's everything that I have. Does anybody have any questions? Did I put everybody to sleep? Are you still there? <laughs> We're here. Oh, good. Oh, good. I do hear voices. That's a good sign. I was kind of scared. <laughs> okay. Um, any questions at all or... No, Lori, I don't have any. Thank you. Okay, sounds good. And like uh, Michelle has said, we're going to probably try to shoot for that uh, 1130 date for the redesign uh, year-end processing. So I don't have anything else. All right. Everybody have a nice day, a nice weekend. We'll talk to you later. Happy Thanksgiving. Everybody. Yes, happy Thanksgiving. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you.